morning, everyone. Thank you very much for giving up your valuable time this morning. My name is Brian Hay from Cultural Cybersecurity, and we're going to embark in the next 60 minutes. A uh, what I certainly demand from these gentlemen that are going to, that are joining me, uh, an informative and compelling conversation around cybercrime migration to critical infrastructure. I would like to acknowledge the support and sponsorship from Nozomi Networks that uh, made this possible today. And uh, I really do look forward to this, uh, this conversation. There are a lot of webinars going on. We know you're getting uh, belted with these invitations. So the fact that you actually registered for this one, and again, took the time out of your day, we're, we're greatly appreciative for. Um, before I introduce these uh, fine gentlemen, I'd just like to let you know, the more you engage with us, the more interesting this is going to be. And so please send some questions through through the chat channel and um, help yourself to asking these, these good people, um, pick their brains because we've, we've got them here uh, for the next 60 minutes and make them uh, make it count for them, make it count for you. So please send your questions in the longer way and we'll try to answer them as we go and make it more um, informative. Now we will be touching on a, uh, a document this morning about the Protecting Critical Infrastructure and Systems of National Significance consultation paper. And I think there will be a link made available for you to, uh, if you don't have it, to resource that uh, as we go through. Now that's enough about uh, the formal introductions. If I could actually now bring on the stars of this event, and that is uh, Jonathan Russ, Professor, UA, former US Department of Justice Prosecutor. I've known Jonathan for over a decade, and I always threaten if he shared some of the stories about me, there would be retribution paid out in a physical, not cyber sense, because he uh, um, he knows too many things. I would also <laughs> like to introduce another good buddy of mine, uh, retired Lieutenant Colonel Bill Hagerstead from the US Marines. Bill Hager said the second. Um, extraordinary gentleman, great insight, expertise in Chinese cyber espionage. And I must say, brilliant author. But one of the most telling things about this book, Bill, was that forward in that book was extraordinary, a piece of literary genius. Um, I don't know where you managed to get those words from, but it was truly remarkable. And of course, um, our Nozomi expert for the panel, Philip Page, Director of Business and Development Partner Technology for, for Nozomi. So, gents, thanks very much. And again, folks, please send your questions in to ask anything of these gentlemen within reason, of course. So, what I want to touch on, you know, the recent announcement, announcement by Prime Minister Scott Morrison should serve as a bit of a wake up call and a warning about nation sponsored attacks, that they are part of our current landscape and they are in reality going to be a significant challenge going forward. And this morning we want to talk about that migration of organised crime, cyber crime to nation sponsored threats and the blurring of the lines. We want to talk about ransomware attacks upon critical infrastructure, but all, not just for profit where most of the conversation tends to go and certainly experiential learning would, would dictate that, but also for power, which may be more around ideology, uh, terrorism and nature sponsored agendas. And of course, critical infrastructure and cyber espionage, especially now, and I want to talk a little bit of gentlemen about, you know, the COVID-19 vaccine and the manufacturing of that and what that potentially could mean from a threat perspective. You know, 2020 will long be remembered for a multitude of reasons, COVID-19 global pandemic, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, the US election, perhaps for all the wrong reasons, the seemingly breakdown of economic relationships between China and Australia, more specifically, and of course, the rise in ransomware and focus by cyber criminals on critical infrastructure and OT systems. So let me throw out a question just to kick things off. Does anyone think ransomware has grown because of the opportunity to attack during the disruption of COVID-19? Or was it destined to evolve from it regardless? Yeah, well, I, th I think, uh, you know, it was really kind of foretold all along. We've seen a huge increase in ransomware attacks, not only against more traditional IT systems, but also critical infrastructure operators. Um, over the past four years, right? The, the most infamous of which were the, the twin WannaCry and not Petya outbreaks in 2017, um, which I think also plays well to your question, Brian, about the hybrid nature of you know, criminal and nation state sponsored attackers. But certainly with COVID-19 and the rise of people working remotely, uh, you know, globally, right, has introduced a lot of new avenues of attack for 
again, both, both traditional criminal enterprises as well as the more terrifying nation state entities to get ransomware as well as more traditional, you know, backdoors into employees' computers and then move into more interesting targets. Well, just on that point, Phil, I've seen that, you know, we look at ransomware and the way it's evolved over certainly in this country in the last 12 months, 10 months, we're seeing the migration from the traditional IT environment more into that OT environment. Is that consistent with what Nazomi has been seeing around the world? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, part of it is because a lot of these OT systems are comprised of traditional IT components. So in some cases, it is very targeted, right? We've seen where, you know, they are using ransomware to to disable uh, OT and ICS systems that you know, form the critical infrastructure components, but also a lot of it may just be accidental. In the case of NotPetya, it was designed to you know, attack the Ukrainian accounting firm and some other companies there and wound up spreading to basically every company in the entire world. Um, so the bottom line is it doesn't matter at the end, right? Whether it's intentional or accidental, it's gonna get into your, to your systems and it's going to infect your stuff and it's gonna cost you money, it's gonna cost you time, Right. Of course, we're going to get into all that later, especially with the uh, you know, the new uh, paper that was published that just came out. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, Jonathan, you've prosecuted uh, organised criminals from a whole. You know, you've got a history of understanding the cyber environment from a global perspective, and like I said, a prosecution perspective. Do you think there's been a lack of preparation potentially in the OT space? For cybercrime, then there was a uh, lack of realization of what the threat what actually truly existed for them and how it was going to evolve towards them? Yes, absolutely. I think part of what I think I've been observing over the last year in particular is that those who have been very successful at, at uh, ransomware attacks have realized, frankly, more quickly than companies or even government entities that have significant OT assets that OT and IT are these days always connected. And I think, frankly, a lot of companies still think, oh, well, there's OT systems sitting in one part of our house and IT is in another part. The reality is these systems all connect in the 21st century. And I think a lot of the more sophisticated ransomware teams, and that includes various state actors who are using ransomware for significant money generation, simply figured it out quicker and recognized that it provides two bites at the apple. You know, it's one thing to say, we're going to cripple your IT. Now, if you say, we're going to cripple your capacity to manufacture, to produce, that's on two levels, a, a significant interim effect on companies who won't start thinking, well, maybe we could you know, survive this or that. They're gonna be thinking, how can we pay and how can we pay quickly? Uh, and, and honestly, I think that what I've seen, you know, at least in my own observation of developments with, with ransomware, is that now you see a broader range of ransomware families that are building in process kill kits, uh, kill lists. So they're thinking systematically now in a way that I think industry has yet to catch up with. You know, the people who are behind ransomware, you know, multiple families, you know, everything from you know, Doppelpamer to Maze, Megacortex and so on, uh, you know, more recent reporting indicates that you know, cyber criminals are thinking about what we can do to cripple or threaten to cripple OT executables and that can be catastrophic, you know, not really burdensome, but catastrophic for a wide range of industries. Okay, so on that point, or oh, I suppose you made a number of points, but you, you, if we talk, okay, ransomware for profit, and they were strategic in their intent of how they can continue to evolve, make the issue more complex, extract more profit for their endeavors. Once upon a time, they just encrypted, and now they're actually st stealing the data, encrypting, want to sell it back, extortion more money, they're interrupting the OT. For once upon a time, they would say, well, here's the encryption keys back for $300. You know what we know by interrupting your OT environment and affecting the production of your manufacturing process, we're costing you $3 million a day. So the ransomware has just gone up for a million bucks. Now that's a complete professional enterprise designed to elicit maximum profit, ROI. And we, if we accept, 
I think that we know that criminals are very well organised and putting that effort into that. Now, Bill, if the organised crime environment is prepared to be patient and strategic to further their endeavours, what does that say then for the nation-sponsored efforts, which may be even more patient, more strategic, and, and dare I say, give us the killer knockout punch, more, yes. more the significant impact? Mm -hmm. hmm. Yes. Weaponization of data, you know, specifically in ransomware uh, types of attacks, is also based on the strategy and motivation of the nation state that you're talking about. If it's Iran, certainly it's going to be destructive. It's not going to be profit motivated. They're still looking to be the leader of the Middle East. When you look at China, for example, certainly they want to get the COVID vaccine so that they can aid America, believe it or not. And if you look at the political climate here in the US, they're supporting uh, Biden. This is not a political statement, it's just fact. When you look at Russia, it's to their advantage to you know, grasp that vaccine and show that they can deliver it as promised by uh, current President Trump and show that they are indeed supporting America. So you've got a, a wide range of motivations of these nation state actors. Uh, but the one thing that they have that we will in the West never have collectively and effectively is information sharing. If you look at the Australian paper that's referenced in the chat, the term sharing of information is only used 10 times. Now, when to answer your question, Brian, that is one of the greatest pitfalls or shortfalls that we have in the West is we do not share information, albeit the US is a little bit differently, but the criminal organizations do that. They will look for those soft targets. You know this from being a, a cop and Jonathan from a prosecutor. They will look for the soft targets and from a military perspective, exploit those until they have done their damage or gathered the economic gain that they need. Yep. So if we said that, I'll, I'll give you an example. We know that um, at one stage, the crooks were writing more malware for the smartphone than they were for the PC. That was probably about five years in advance before the big mobile um, device uptake. So if we said, let's pair that back to say, the crooks are thinking three years in advance, what would nation-sponsored attacks be? What would they, how far in advance would they be thinking in terms of strategy development? Nation states, they will be 10 years plus ahead. They think in longer terms. Certainly the Chinese think in the 12 fifth year plan, which is 60 plus years. Uh, the Russians, I mean, when they elect a uh, leader for life, much like the Chinese have followed suit, and certainly the Iranians have the Ayatollah Khomeini, they're playing a very long game that our Western ideals cannot match because of instantaneous gratification and the democratic process that makes us the West. Um, we just can't play in that same realm the only way that we've been able to do it, of course, is kinetically through the military actions in different theaters of operation. Cyber is okay. now one of those theaters of operation. Okay, I'd like to come back to that point, just mindful of time. We have a question. Do you see destructive nation state based attacks such as Notpetya to increase, Philip? Oh, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, it's already been proven. I think that Notpetya exceeded beyond the, the Russians, those wildest, imaginations and designs, right? And we've seen others follow suit. I mean, it was repurposed, you know, the Eternal Blue Exploit, which was developed by the United States military, um, was repurposed multiple times, you know, within that. And ransomware is such a critical, I'd say it's such a fantastic style of attack because, you know, it forces your enemies to capitulate. Even though not catch you, most interestingly, did not give you the decryption keys if you paid the ransom. Um, certainly for, you know, we, if we talk about Bill's you know, piece on motivation, somebody like the North Koreans have a great motivation to continue to get income. Whereas in the case of you know, certain actors, Iran, Russia, right, it's purely destructive, which is to cripple their adversaries. And uh, it did a you know, really good job of it. So I think we're gonna continue to see that, especially when the goal has shifted from, you know, crippling traditional IT systems to taking out power, taking out, you know, oil production capabilities, taking out air traffic and shipping, um, which, you know, I think Brian is going to be really important as we start discussing more of the economic situation between Australia and China, where now, you know, there's a direct economic incentive for foreign actors to intervene in the Australian manufacturing entities and, and the rest of the Australian economy. I think you make a really interesting point. One of the things we've experienced here in Australia, Philip, is that it's been during the COVID situation, 
and the challenge that it represents to us all is that Australia has been once upon a time was a nation of producers, manufacturers and self-sufficiency in terms of our, you know, simple things like face masks. And we've offshored and outsourced a lot of that to offshore, which we have become completely dependent upon um, other countries who, guess what? Their priorities aren't necessarily Australia. So there's been a lot of debate and calling for building Australia's capacity to start to become a manufacturing neighbor, a nation once again and become more self-sufficient. Does that then bring, obviously because we've got higher wages costs, that then brings more automation in terms of manufacturing development, robotics and the like. What I'm going for is obviously OT environments. Gentlemen, do we need to start thinking about security that OT before as part of stage one, rather than worrying about building the plant, securing it afterwards? I would Absolutely. suggest, Brian, yes, Australia should, well, you know, striving to become a manufacturing state in a, a you know, an industrial world perspective, getting that infrastructure level set and building in defense in depth proactively and actively before they go online is probably going to be critical. Finding those vendor partners out there that can help secure it before you bring it online, looking for those vulnerabilities and patching them and building that as part of the security consciousness of the organization all the way to the board level, rather than having that first data breach come and slap you on the rear end and say, hey, it's time to wake up. And I just add to that, that in part because of something that Bill mentioned a few minutes ago, with the most well-organized and the most efficient state actors, and we've already mentioned several of the, the key nations in that regard. As he said, they, well, China operates on a very lengthy time frame. They're gonna be constantly looking for every new development, every new potential inroad that can be made into IT systems, uh, into IT deployment and so on. So, you know, no company that's thinking, oh, we can build up our manufacturing capacity. And then once we're really well you know, advanced to that, now we'll start thinking about cybersecurity. If you're really that good and your intellectual property is that valuable, the game is probably lost already. So I think Bill's point is a, cr a critical one. To think from the get-go, you need to plan for cybersecurity, even if you're a smaller firm, even if you're just getting off the ground, you're not an, a national uh, household name yet, but you have to think about these things now because in my estimation, at least, the sophistication and the patience of the best state actor cyber teams and independent cyber actor teams will only get better and more uh, pointed over time. Make no right. mistake though, gentlemen, Brian, this is an asymmetric war that Australia is, is yet to start to fight. Uh, the Chinese have been long gorging themselves on joint ventures all across Australia focused on the natural resources. Those have left and gone out the back door to refocus on manufacturing. Um, one must, as Jonathan put it, you know, restart the, the engines to focus on protecting the intellectual property. I've said over the years, for the past decade at least, Australian firms ought to think perhaps more about just selling the intellectual property rather than having the Chinese come and steal it from them and then find that their winning position as an economic uh, company on the national stage has long been lost vis-a-vis uh, -vis Nortel in Canada, for example. So it sounds like, you know, someone's been listening to you, Bill, because when we look at the, the paper that's just been put out, it's a consultation paper, and it, in that there's an opening statement there put out by the Australian government, critical infrastructure is increasingly interconnected and interdependent, delivering efficiencies and economic benefits to operations. However, connectivity without proper safeguards creates vulnerabilities that can deliberately or inadvertently cause disruption that could result in cascading consequences across our economy, security, and in, in my emphasis, that they mention sovereignty, which is, was, I don't think you're much higher than that, so that's massive. Interestingly to me, they, um, it appears they're setting the mandate to introduce regulations to actually set some sort of benchmark to ensure that the fact that the government's now indicating a regulatory response to this challenge, does it mean that it's lost faith in the Australian uh, market to manage themselves? 
I believe that it has, Brian. If you look at other nation states that have faced this, and certainly the U.S. is an indicative of this, there are three things that will happen to a country if they fail to act on their own. You're seeing legislate, you're seeing self-regulate, and then you're seeing regulate. The countries that have been able to figure this out vis-a-vis -vis perhaps even America to a lesser degree have been able to share that thread information. When you look at the paper that's come out by the Australians, they're talking about a trusted network of sharing that will help foster that threat awareness before things happen. Or if they do hit one critical infrastructure, the other critical infrastructures can start to realize what that is and prepare to defend against it or proactively prepare to go on the offense perhaps. Since uh, Australia is now building, I think, uh, or adding a $60 billion uh, Australian investment into the military to defend the uh, critical na national infrastructure. And I think one other thing to point out from the consultation paper on critical infrastructure is that I think the government quite properly says there's a need for uplift in security and resilience in all critical infrastructure sectors. Well, um, that's <clears> really a, a call to arms, I think, for anybody who is in the cybersecurity field. And people can't think, well, this is my little niche and that's how we're going to market ourselves or we're gonna to appeal to this particular category of infrastructure protection. I think more and more, even across multiple sectors of critical infrastructure, clearly the government is expressing a strong intention to engage with them but I think it's equally important that across all critical infrastructure sectors that private sector entities already be, if they're not now, in the process of engaging with each other and sharing information with each other now about what they can be doing to improve security and resilience. In other words, don't wait for the government to tell you what it thinks. Start making your own plans now and start talking to each other on these issues because if you don't do it sooner or later, the government will start those discussions, but maybe it's starting them later than they ought to be going on. And we right. saw some of this, we saw some of this already. I mean, especially I'd say the, the industries and, ver and sectors that are already highly regulated on the production side. Um, so I'll give you two great examples, both of them related to healthcare. So a few years ago, um, the Chinese hacked Anthem, which is a major healthcare provider for the U.S. federal government. Long story short, the intention was to find targets for converting and use in espionage. But what happened through that, at the time I was working with several healthcare providers in the United States, they actually were sharing information among each other because the blowback to that was so swift and severe from both the public relations as well as the legislative standpoint that they had no choice at the executive level you know, all of the different healthcare operators were talking to one another, you know, the insurance operators talking to one another and making sure that there was this kind of common, you know, we'll say kind of common baseline for our understanding of how they could protect their systems. And we saw this again when Merck was hit by NotPetchy in 2017. Um, you know, we have a lot of pharmaceutical sector customers that again, you know, the, the CISOs got on the horn with their friends and were discussing, hey, look, what are you guys doing to make sure Merck doesn't happen to you? Right. What, do you, what controls are you guys putting in place? What frameworks are you adopting? Um, but again, that's because those industries are highly regulated and, of course, very critical to the health and welfare of many nation states. You know, if we take a, say, maybe a, a lesser known, to, to Jonathan's point, a lesser known sector that maybe thinks they're going to escape, you know, the wrath of a nation state actor, even a criminal enterprise, then there's not quite that level of understanding and, and kind of common knowledge being shared. So. Phil, from a Nozomi perspective and through the lens of Nozomi having a, a global view, um, are you able to share in your experience whether the introduction of a regulatory regime has actually improved and reduced the risk to uh, IT attacks through critical infrastructure yeah. compromise? I mean, absolutely. You know, as much as, you know, we hate to say it, sometimes the market will not act, especially when we talk about industries that are very slow to move in the first place. Power utilities are the classic example where, you know, unless regulators are coming and forcing them to adopt certain standards, there wasn't a lot of money for it. There wasn't, you know, a lot of the stuff in place. However, there's very good systems around the world to ensure that power utilities are able to keep the lights on both through reliability, right, making sure they have proper transmission redundancy set up distribution redundancy, but also on the computer operations side, making sure that they're adhering to specific standards. So they were the first ones to move. Interestingly enough, the second ones, which are not necessarily as highly regulated in the United States, a lot of Western countries, but certainly 
in other countries is oil and gas. Um, as a source of sovereign wealth for most, you know, not most, but a lot of developed nations on Earth and many developing nations, you know, a lot of those governments realized right away they needed to force their both their private sector as well as the public sector operators to adopt security standards. Um, and so we saw those two sectors were the first to move very aggressively into a more robust OT security framework for critical infrastructure protection. And that's, again, you know, I think a good template for adoption in other verticals as we move forward. Okay. I think one of the interesting things that's come up already is that the necessity to share intelligence and information. Um, and let me be fully upfront from based on my background and experience, the Commonwealth, whilst it talks about aggregating and sharing intelligence, it does not have a good record for actually doing it. You know, like even within my former law enforcement agency, you know, our centralized intelligence hub had a reputation for being a black hole. Now I can tell you in, in, in 15 years as operational commander of fraud and cyber crime, um, I virtually never ever got intelligence dissemination on such threats from a Commonwealth or federal agency. It was extremely rare and very limited and is normally when it was being driven by the states anyway. I know talking around the country to certain uh, clients that do participate in some of the JCSC arrangements and get some information, too much is held back. So is there, I, I think there is a danger in relying upon, you know what, one central agency at the behest of government will determine what we will know. So do we need to then build a culture that we share information amongst ourselves, our, our industries, our type communities, and is there a role there, Phil, for vendors uh, to actually play the facilitation or just make sure you proactively share with uh, not just your clients, but the broader industry as a, as a proactive measure? Oh, the policy experts go first, probably answer. <laughs> John, well, you've been on international committees. Please share your thoughts. Sure. Well, I would say there are a couple of examples that I've seen in the United States, I mean, even though they may be more law enforcement oriented primarily, I think the model that perhaps some of this discussion in Australia should go toward is not just, well, you know, let's have the ASD sit down with key leaders from industry sectors. I think you have to be thinking about a shared environment where private sector, and maybe you do it on a rotating basis, private sector information security people are co-located virtually or literally with their counterparts from key law enforcement and intelligence agencies. So you have a constant interaction, a constant exchange of information. I think the model unfortunately has been for too long that well, we'll wait for a big event to happen and then we'll have a response and then we'll put out a message saying, you know, watch out for business email compromise schemes or watch out for ransomware. I think especially with the, uh, the emphasis that I see in, in some of the government documents, which indicate the Australian government wants to have, they say, near real-time exchange of information. That's fine if you're talking about getting information very quickly from a company that's been hit by a major cyber attack, a major ransomware attack. But if you want to be proactive, if you want to be strategic, you need to do in some respects what the best of the state actors are doing to attack. That is, you've got to be constantly sharing information. And maybe that means in some respects, you're going to have to give out <laughs> classifications to private sector people who come in. The virtue is you're not thinking about, here's a document. Here's another document. Here's an advisory. You've got to be thinking about managing the flow, reviewing the flow together. And I think if you can get a model like that going, where it's real information, timely information about the latest twists and turns and what your key cyber threats are, are uh, threatening against industry or government, there you may have, I think, a real potential for meaningful response. But if it comes down to the usual, well, it's time for a monthly meeting with our private sector counterparts, you might as well just give up the game because you're never going to be able to achieve the velocity of response or the velocity of intelligence gathering you need to be effective. Generally, the the, re, 
the behaviour is for, and I'm just using Canberra as, as, as a term, to summons the industry to Canberra to then tell them what they choose for them to know. Should there be a more of a reach out program? I know we've got the JC, these hubs called JCSC in a number of different states, but rather than that, should there be industry liaison officers that are, they're committed and paid for by government agencies to do exactly that, to get intelligence, but to share quid pro quo on a meaningful basis. Um, you think that's in the interest of a, a nation security bill? Um, is, actually, let me, back, let me back the conversation up one. In 2013, President Obama signed Presidential Policy Directive 21. In 2013, this basically mandated that the 16 areas of critical infrastructure across the United States begin to share publicly and privately within a closed environment in the con uh, concept of an information sharing analysis center. Philip talked about the healthcare, health pharma uh, world. They have a very developed information sharing analysis. It's called the HISAC. There's a financial services ISAC. All of these 16 areas are already doing this. So there isn't really a necessity to rely on law enforcement at the local level. That's just not gonna happen. They just are more concerned with mobs not necessarily sharing data. The federal level, we're actually starting to see in the United States where the FBI is sharing a number of notifications to industry on a regular basis. Granted, they're not sharing some of the high side or classified information, but many of it is relevant and actively uh, necessary for these organizations in the private uh, world to action that information. This gets back to the information sharing that is absent in the current Australian directorate. The one question I would ask if I were in, uh, an Australian citizen, I would ask Canberra, who's going to protect my network if the stuff really goes south? It will not be the military. You're going to look in the mirror and it's going to be you. And you need to figure out how to get that information from your partners across the industries and, and industry partners and vendors in order to better do a better job of protecting their infrastructure. So do you think we've been uh, dieting on a feast of apathy at the moment in terms of the OT and critical infrastructure risk? Absolutely. Yes, I mean, it, it's to, to Jonathan's point and Philip's point earlier, uh, it, it seems as if the two words almost alphabetically are distant enough that people think that they are not connected, but indeed they are connected all the time because of this uh, 24 by 7 by 365 world that, especially if Australia is going to be, become a manufacturing powerhouse, you're going to need to be connected all the time. What that means then is your threat surface just went from five days a week to 365 days a week. You now have to defend all the time against all threats. But that doesn't mean that you're going to be automatically losing the minute you uh, turn on that router. Focus on what the active threat is that your organization should be uh, you know, fearful of. Is it a competitor in China or is it a specific entity in Russia? Or have you, you know, managed to torque off some Iranian cleric somewhere deep inside Iran because you said something or a representative of your company said something? That's the greater threat, I believe. All right. Any other I, comment I would, on that? Yeah, I would slightly disagree with your use of the word apathy, Brian, although I think you know, Bill's points are well taken. I think in some respects, at least from a U.S. perspective, I see some developments that I think are remarkable when you see how governmental processes generally work. I think for the first time this year, you're actually seeing the FBI and the National Security Agency and the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency at Homeland Security issuing joint advisories, joint warnings to industry. That in itself should tell you something about who has to be talking to whom even within government in order to come up with timely and meaningful generic intelligence. I think part of the problem here is that I wouldn't say it's apathy. I think it's more like until you make C-level officials cognizant of how severe a threat there is, you know, even the best informed, the best plugged in information security officer is going to have difficulty in developing meaningful responses and having meaningful resources. And I think so often these days, even today, even in you know major companies, C-level officials who don't have an information security background tend to doze off when their CISO starts telling them about the latest trends, latest techniques. And I think that's a gap that's been there for a long time in, in many different sectors. But I think when it comes to critical things, information security officers 
you know, maybe joining up with their chief legal officers or others say, look, I'm going to spell this out for you in one and two syllable words, and I want you to understand why this threat is so much worse, poses so much greater risk to us, and will be just getting worse if we don't do something about it. So I think it's not apathy. I think it's literally lack of comprehension and maybe an assumption that, oh, well, people are talking at me about information security. Oh, that's geek speak. I don't have to know that stuff. And the short answer is, yes, you do. If you value your job, <laughs> if you value yeah. your company's reputation and its assets. We'd also seen for a while, one of the bigger issues that was plaguing the industry, it's gotten better, right? It has over the past few years. But when I first joined his own, back in 2017, um, you had IT and, and the CISO responsible for IT security. They had operational technology, which was a the purview of typically either an operations officer or a director of engineering. Um, and that was a firewall. I mean, those organizations, there was a little bit of support from IT, maybe for managing you know, internet connectivity or VPN, you know, uh, MPLS connectivity between sites. But it was a, a cloistered environment you know, with a very specialized skill set that a lot of IT people weren't familiar with and a lot of OT people weren't familiar with IT stuff. And that was it. And that was the division. And I still come across, there's you know, plenty of Fortune 100 companies that were operating in this model. Uh, you know, not catchy happened, right? And then things, the conversation started to shift, but there's still, um, I'd say it's been very slow in the migration of responsibility at the corporate level from OT is its own thing, you leave them alone, to IT now has responsibility and the security skill set that's necessary to help protect OT. And we're just now seeing this in, you know, three years later after this huge crash outbreaks, finally starting to shift, right? I'd say at this point, maybe about half, maybe a little bit more than half our customers operate in this model. But in fact, it's taken three years for the person in charge of cybersecurity to be responsible for cybersecurity for the entire organization is, you know, speaks to how slow some of the changes are uh, at some of these organizations. So to, to exactly to that point, Phil, and going to back what Bill was saying, is that why we've seen the increased focus on OT? Because it's been enabled through the, the migration of IT overlay. I mean, absolutely. Yeah. I think it, it's, it's going to be, you know, we talk about information sharing, and that's really what it comes down to. You have one person responsible for cybersecurity for everything, right? So it doesn't matter if it's a programmable logic controller causing a robotic arm to go up and down, or if it's, you know, an employee workstation, they're taken to, to Starbucks. Um, it's the same person, you know, that sits at the executive table, right, that has that responsibility. And that's what it comes down to. And I think you can apply the same lessons to government, too. In the United States, we infamously had, what, 30 different agencies responsible for, you know, what eventually became the Department of Homeland Security. And while there's a lot to be said about how the efficacy of that organization, it still speaks to the fact that, you know, there's a lot of, if you're not having a single person be responsible for stuff, then things are never going to get done or they're going to get duplicated and it's going to grab up costs. And so, yeah. Okay, let me put this to you, gentlemen. So we, we, we see the introduction of a, leg, leg, reg, a regulatory framework for Australia to for critical infrastructure. And we, in this ties in, whether it be production, be manufacturing, be it uh, electricity, oil and gas, resources, health, pharma, pharma. And as a consequence, we get the regulation process in. Um, we've got treaties with other countries such as the Five Eyes, which is, is a major one for Australia. Do you think we'll start to see regulation creep into the Five Eyes arrangements that we won't be able to do certain trade or business with other countries unless our critical infrastructure meets certain regulatory standards? So that is, will this give impetus to the evolution of international legislation and regulation? Thoughts? I think absolutely, yeah. We're actually, we're working on a program right now with the Pentagon uh, called the CMMC which is a framework for the private sector to do business with the U.S. Department of Defense and other NATO and Five Eyes entities. And the idea here was that you have, you also go back, I think Brian, you brought it up, you have a very small operator, you know, who is a brand new entity in the Australian market, and they want to win a, a contract with the Australian government in order to, you know, outfit um, some sort of system. The idea now is that in the United States, they want to have this framework that makes sure that they are compliant with NIST standards for cybersecurity, no matter their size. So everybody from Lockheed Martin's flying the F-35 down to the people manufacturing the screws for the F-35 are all adhering to this framework that, you know, basically not, not necessarily based on size, based upon the criticality of the systems they're providing, 
has to adhere to certain both governance controls, but I think more, more importantly, actual security controls, real things that have you know, actual value to the organization. Um, and you know, it's going to affect something like 300 to 400,000 different firms in the US. And of course, other Five Eyes, NATO, you know, entities, including, you know, again, Japan's in a joint defense agreement with the United States are beginning to look at this and say, we want something similar for our suppliers as well. And also your suppliers that are supplying our suppliers. Okay. Okay. Leaving I, that I would say, soccer. Brian, I'd be, sorry, let me just jump in yep. quickly. Yep, I please. would be more pessimistic than Phil in some respects about the prospects for Five Eyes Nations, you know, basically leveling up to the same standards if we're talking about legislation. I mean, certainly there's you know, positive developments like the, uh, the Joint Cybersecurity Advisory that the Five Eyes issued just last Tuesday, meant to help companies in figuring out how to investigate incidents and uh, how they can better uncover malicious activity. I think, however, that there's likely to be, when you hit the United States, enormous resistance to any kind of regulation that's going to compel companies in all sectors to have the kind of basically mandatory reporting requirement that clearly the, the current Australian government's plans contemplates. Uh, I, mean, I think many companies, uh, even after seeing some of the more disastrous instances of uh, uh, identity theft and, uh, uh, and major breaches where they've held back on data, uh, you know, letting the public know about these things, I think a lot of IT companies and companies in other sectors are gonna say, well, of course, we, we're all in favor of greater info security, but I shouldn't be uh, required to report to federal agencies uh, about these things. And I am willing to bet that, you know, I'm not just talking about this administration. I can imagine another administration down the road where that will still get enormous resistance. So I think the Five Eyes process is likely to lead to improvements but I suspect in the short term, and by short term, I mean like the next year to three years, those increments, uh, those improvements will be incremental and limited to things that don't make companies do things in compliance with the law or regulation. So instead of a compliance rating, what if it moved to a risk rating that entities actually were by virtue of their maturity and what they've done and where they sit and what intelligence holds, they are assigned a risk rating. Yeah, so actually, I, I'm sitting through a really interesting uh, speech from a, a woman who's an analyst with Moody's, right? So the credit scoring agency that scores, you know, public and private debt. Um, this is about a year ago, and she actually said that they are going to begin taking cyber risk into consideration when scoring public and private debt. So if you're a company and you're trying to get, again, you're trying to go out and issue debt uh, as a form of, you know, raising capital, you're not going to be able to get a good credit rating if you have you know, no cyber risk strategy in place. I think the most ironic example is that Experian had theirs downgraded because they got hacked and had nothing in place and had a terrible response plan. Um, and that's, you know, probably one of the more extreme examples, but certainly if, you, if you're a country, but also if you're a private entity, you know, that's trying to play in that market, you're gonna have to start seriously taking it, you know, not for granted anymore. And that's gonna take up everything from financial systems, but certainly OT systems, if you're a manufacturer, Right, or if you're anybody that provides a critical service uh, through ICS, you know, industrial control systems. Okay, yeah. so that's a bit of strategic view going forward and how this could all play out. I want to bring you back, gentlemen, to the here and now with COVID-19. What we mentioned before was the vaccine. We know vaccine research has taken place in universities, within uh, uh, pharma companies, uh, within our medical services and hospitals. What can they expect? How, how, how is that going to pan out in the rush for the vaccine from a global perspective? And how likely do you think it is that we could see a cyber espionage bill on these entities in order for competitive advantage with another international market or entity? Oh, it, it, it's an enduring thing. Uh, cyber espionage, particularly from the Chinese who are very good at it, perhaps uh, the best, and I say that from a parochial perspective, but when you look at the Verizon data breach report, uh, incident report, average dwell time on a network for an adversary is 143 days before it's noticed. That means that those hackers, those cyber thieves, those cyber spies have been doing directory traversal. They've been looking at all the directories, scooping up, hoovering as the Brits call it, 
all of the data of significance and essentially exfiltrating it before they're even noticed. So all of these pharma firms uh, that Phil had mentioned, Merck among others, uh, they've already been perhaps even had their data siphoned off before they even realize it. This gets back to the point about selling it to the most likely adversary. Um, and of course, certainly from a Chinese perspective, understanding who is wanting to be uh, engaging with your firm as a joint venture partner, because someone behind them, second or third order, is going to be tied to the Communist Party boys and girls in Beijing. And they will have had a mandate as a state-owned enterprise to go after specific companies within particular industry verticals, such as, to your point in question, Brian, uh, pharma and vaccine development types of firms, both on the research side as well as on the commercial side. They are already under attack. They just don't realize it yet. And I would add to that, it's not just the it's not just the pharma industry that's part of the threat environment here. It's universities that are partnering with this kind of research. And I mean, based on very recent reporting, it's clear that multiple uh, nations, uh, China, Russia, Iran, are all looking to steal information. And they know that, well, maybe it's, it's kind of tough to crack the uh, the security of, you know, leading pharma firm A or leading pharma firm B. Universities uh, and, you know, private corporations as well that are doing research here are very much a target of this kind of, of activity. Uh, I think one of the, the more remarkable things I saw in some recent public reporting here in the States was that NATO intelligence is now expanding its frame of reference because of efforts by the Russians to steal vaccine research, that they've now baked that into their own intelligence uh, research and analysis processes, along with all the other more conventional kinds of, uh, of efforts to acquire military intelligence, intellectual property, and so on. Uh, and I think that that connection has to keep being focused on if we're trying to, to deal effectively these kinds of state actor attacks to get you know, much needed vaccine research and, and vaccine data. So, okay, let me put this scenario to you then, gentlemen. We have a situation that I think we agree that the pharmaceutical industry and associated entities in the furtherance of developing the COVID-19 can be expected to be under attack by virtue of um, their research, their intellectual property, because there is currently a global race on for the first vaccine that can be safely produced en masse to save the world. And obviously that will generate billions of dollars. Yeah, you with me? Is there a lesson there for, for the scumbags out there? When I talk about that, uh, I do so with great respect, well, some respect for their skills. The cyber criminal community say, hang on, there's a money opportunity here. What if we become guns of hire to knock out our competitors through cyber espionage attacks? And now we're going to do that as a commercial profit arrangement. For take, we'll take down your competitor for that manufacturing or plant production operation. So all of a sudden you can't produce and we'll take your market share globally. Is that real? It is very real. In fact, Brian, the book that you wrote uh, the forward for, I predicted that in terms of state-owned enterprise uh, within that China. Was a brilliant Bring, forward, my I know you were just, it was amazing. like, yeah, but that that's actually the first edition, by the way. Second edition is more dangerous. But anyway, uh, state-owned enterprises are hiring some of the uh, the leftovers from the Chinese military, for example, the ones that uh, were good enough to get the nation state ideas. And what essentially is happening is these hackers that are working for some like Sinovac, for example, who's the leading Chinese uh, vaccine developer that uh, actually created the trials for the Chinese military. They are having other firms within China trying to hack them in order to get a competitive advantage so they can gain the favor of the Communist Party in Beijing. When you have that type of dynamic hacking environment, the gloves are definitely off. Imagine that type of attention being paid on an entity in Australia, for example, and you've already lost. You might as well just go home right now. Okay. Phil? Well, I think, you know, Russia has also had a, a long and storied history of, of kind of either, you know, turning a blind eye and in some respects leveraging their criminal cyber, you know, cyber crime enterprises there um, to support their own state activities. Right, whether it's through you know kind of like a privateering style arrangement, or through direct recruitment, again either through you know coercion or through just paying them off. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if we see the same strategy. I mean, they've used it in the past, you know, many times against uh, you know Western adversaries as they see them. 
Um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they're, they're trying the same thing now, especially you know with criminal enterprises that have a lot of experience targeting manufacturers of pharmaceuticals as well as research and development companies. Okay. Actually, Phil, if I, if I could touch on the Russian point for one second. So on a recent trip to Moscow, I watched the FSB sitting in tandem with some of the FBI's most wanted Russian hackers. I mean, if I had had a suitcase where I could have carried these individuals, these scumbags to Brian's point, in a suitcase, I would be a multimillionaire because you're talking about everyone from the, uh, you know, the first hack of Adobe uh, through, you know, some of the offensive hackers all sitting in the speaker ready room with the FSB carefully watching what they were doing. So it is endorsed by law enforcement inside Russia. Absolutely correct. Sir. And it's in keeping with their broader strategy, right? I mean, you know, in Syria, for example, mm -hmm. they've employed a large number of contractors to go fight for them. It makes sense, you know, they try the same thing with their espionage as well. Absolutely. Does that mean that, that means then do we uh, that that prosecution is a waste of uh, focus and effort at this point in time? We have a question. I'll read it to you, and it, I apologise to the person who put this question because I've been sitting here for a little while. But you, these guys wouldn't shut up. But how do you see law enforcement controlling the ephemeral tr uh, threat of a nation state actor? Well, this cannot be readily attributed, or where the kinetic effect of these attacks is not immediately obvious. Considering the lack of international treaties, what avenues are available to pursue these actors, and what, if any, offensive actions could be available? If you're talking about conventional law enforcement, and I base this uh, in large part on my, my former employer, the U.S. Department of Justice's efforts over the last several years, uh, they can identify with sufficient precision to get grand jury indictments individuals who are employed by the Russian GRU or the People's Liberation Army in China to put their names into an indictment and specify the specific acts in which they've engaged. Will those people ever come within the reach of U.S. jurisdiction? Absolutely not. Uh, and I think their own employers will say, just make sure you don't travel to this country or that country. Uh, because you know that might be a place where the United States would be able to lay hands on you and get you extradited. I think a lot of what the Department of Justice has done with these indictments is mostly to say, actually, we can see you, we can identify who you are, and to the extent that it helps with sort of the larger public policy uh, about, we have to pay attention to ransomware, we have to pay attention to state actors as cyber actors going after key US assets, it's helpful. I think the greater uh, value from law enforcement is simply going to be, you know, we're never going to be able to indict and try our way out of cyber crime. What you can do is get better intelligence sharing, both within a national government among the multiple agencies that are there, and better information sharing between law enforcement, the intelligence community, and the private sector. That's where I think law enforcement is likely to play its most meaningful role in the long run. Yeah, look, I remember uh, getting on a, a stage once, I might have been an FBI conference and talking about uh, law enforcement developing a culture of a willingness to contribute to the global effort without expectation of return. And for me, one of the things I realized very early in the piece in the world of financial crime and uh, cyber crime is that forget about locking up the crook, start, to me, we've already lost. How do you start preventing and supporting the, your community to be more resilient and to that point, and I applaud the Australian government for its recognition that it needs to develop and initiate greater intelligence and information sharing. And Phil, I think I asked you this before. My view is that I think vendors such as Nozomi can be play a massive role in that sort of facilitation. Yeah, we already are. Um, you know, our security research team, day in and day out, right, they're working with industry partners. So they're working with the automation vendors that manufacture the OT equipment to identify threats, not just with the equipment itself, but trends that we're seeing in the field reported to us, you know, from our customers, from our partners, and then working with the vendors to not only address these risks through responsible exposure, you know, avenues, but also working with ICS CERT, for example, these collaborative information sharing organizations to ensure this information is pushed out there in the public where people can make use of it in order to protect their systems. Um, and I think, you know, there is a place for, for private sector vendors who have a little bit different view. And if we talk about, you know, to, uh, I think to Jonathan's point earlier about, you know, somewhat of a reluctance of companies to go out there 
well, you know, again, if we can abstract some of their private details away from it, there's still a lot of really good information that the private sector can provide to the government and vice versa, of course. All right, gentlemen, I'm going to ask you each one question. You only have one minute each. That is 60 seconds, uh, just to wind things up. Um, uh, if you can do it in less than 60 seconds, that'd be great because you've got three minutes on the clock. Uh, Bill, it's the same yes. question to all of you gents. If you could leave our delegates with one final thought today, what would it be? Learn Mandarin Chinese <laughs> and develop an active, active measures type of policy within your corporate enterprise and work with your government industry, uh, government and industry partners to develop a active offensive uh, capability combined with cyber threat intelligence. Back to you, Brian. Okay. Thank you. John? My if one thought would be... Delegates with one final thought, what would it be? Yes. I think it would be assume that however good your cybersecurity is, it's still inadequate and you have to make sure that you are, even in anticipation of possible regulation in the future, doing everything you need to do to treat cybersecurity as a genuine 24-7, 365 challenge for your organization, and that you have to convey that in words as simple as possible to your C-level officials, that that's what's necessary. I think to the extent that there are examples you can point to of other companies that have really call, you know, run afoul of, uh, of uh, major security problems. I think it, people just need to try to do more of a, a task of sh showing those C-level officials because if regulation comes into play, then those C-level officials will be even more on the hook if their organization fails to maintain sound cybersecurity on that same 7 uh, 24 365 basis. Thank you. And uh, closing words to you, Phil. If you could leave yeah, so, our delegates with one final thought, what would it be? So I think it's really important, you know, to be proactive, right? Kind of echoing you know, what Jonathan and Bill have already said, be proactive. And I think, you know, one of the things that, that really a lot of organizations miss too is picking tools that actually work. Um, I've worked, you know, internal IT, internal IT security at, at a number of companies in my career where we just check the box. We love checking the box with tool sets, you know, that critical, that were critical tools, things like, you know, IDSs, IPSs, firewalls. Um, but if you don't have a tool that works the way it's supposed to, that really actually achieves the goals of that control, then you're just wasting your money and your time and you're opening yourself up to, to failure. So again, the technology piece is just as important as the security governance piece. And that's why they're together, you know, a lot of these fun flow charts that we see. All right, gentlemen, thank you very much for your time and thank you to all the delegates who gave up and surrendered your valuable time this morning to share this hour with us. I hope we've evoked some thought and planted a few seeds and by no means are we saying we're right, we're, we're just four crusty old, well, okay, Phil, you're not that old, but uh, the rest I'm of the crusty. other three staff. <laughs> just crusty. Uh, and look, it, the whole purpose of these webinars is a little bit of thought leadership to stimulate conversation, more importantly, to stimulate mind share. So, Hope you've enjoyed it. We thank you again. And uh, this session was recorded and I think it's been made available for Nozomi. There are some links at the back end for further information. And we uh, thank you so much for your time and uh, look forward to doing something like this again. Fantastic. Have a great day, everyone. Cheers. Mm -hmm.